Welcome back to Geek Archaeology. Thank you very much for joining me, where today I'm reviewing not an anime, but a book about anime. This is Anime Supremacy, a novel, actually, that is about the anime industry, which is quite interesting and unusual. Um, it is originally a Japanese novel, written by a Japanese person, in other words, translated into English. Uh, it came out in, I believe, 2013. It's about 400 pages, so it's pretty long uh, with fairly large texts, but this is definitely something that will take you a little while to get through. Um, there are, a, you know, this is not really a light novel in the sense that it probably falls into the light novel category technically, but it's pretty lengthy and there are only, I think, three or four illustrations total in the, uh, uh, the whole thing. So I think it counts more as a novel novel. The story is about basically three different women working in the anime industry itself. Um, one's a producer, one's a director, and one's an animator, but they're all working at different anime studios. Uh, and in some cases, actually I think they're all, they are all at actual studios. So you get to see the interplay. The producer's show is kind of um, rivaling the director's show. So there's a little bit of that. And then the animator is working for a company that that animates for both of them. So you get to see a lot of stuff. We get to read about a lot of stuff having to do with how the anime industry actually works from a boots on the ground, you know, employees perspective. The book is obviously very heavily researched. There's a lot of information about there. And I'll get to that in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, lots of uh, industry info as well as some plot and story as the characters kind of develop their um uh, as, as time moves on in their careers, if you will, in their jobs. Uh, so the first half focuses very heavily on the inner workings of the anime industry and what goes on there. By the last half of the novel, though, there's a lot more plot going on, and obviously no spoilers here. But you know, in general, you get a lot of kind of facts and figures in the first half. Um, and then once you kind of understand all that stuff, they can kind of let the plot develop in the last half of the novel. The beginning can feel a little frustrating, I should point out, as the producer, um, the producer has to basically manage the director of the anime series they're working on, and the director is this kind of frustrating man-child character, somebody who is just very inconsiderate and um, one of these wunderkind kind of people. What's funny for those of us who are kind of more into these things is that the director is clearly a mashup of Kunihiko Ikuhara of Sailor Moon and Utna, and Hideaki Anno of Evangelion and other things. Mashup of, of personality as well as kind of career. So you get to see all that kind of stuff going on, which is, which is a lot of fun. Um, but because one of the central characters is this really frustrating person, there can be a certain amount, especially from Americans, of this, you know, why are you putting up with this person? It's clear why, because the person does, um, is kind of a genius and is well known, but it is, it's still off-putting, I think, to a lot of Westerners. Um, in general, the characters and their relationships do feel wonderfully realistic, and that's actually one of the interesting things, is that the relationships of this are very strained a lot of the time. Working in the anime industry, there are huge, huge amounts of um, work to be done and huge amounts of stress. Trying to maintain a any semblance of a normal life is practically impossible. And so when you want to talk with somebody or have a relationship with somebody or so forth and so on, it is impossible to fit that in with everything you're trying to do. So I think they do a, a, the author does a, an excellent job of relating that and showing that without making it seem completely unrealistic, without making it seem like these folks are working so hard and so long that they're kind of um, machines in this cog. Now, granted, there is a certain element of that too, but it, it feels like real people in the real world, in other words. Um, it's not, they don't go too over the top with it. Um, I should point out, um, regarding the writing in general, is that, uh, there's one thing there, is that there, it does start with all these facts and figures, but it becomes a little more natural, if you will, later on in how the the writing is presented. So, like, early on, there's a lot of 
bouncing back and forth between kind of info dump and dialogue. Um, I have some problems with that. I don't think it's very deftly handled. That said, it's very hard to make any novel set in this very different environment, this very high pressure environment, in this, this environment with all these different, you know, how does animation work? What are the rules and what are the roles and who's doing what? All that, there's a lot to explain to the, the, the reader. So I don't know quite how they fix that, but it does feel jarring a lot. Um, that said, the dialogue, you know, in terms of, of writing quality, the dialogue doesn't vary that much from character to character. You know, there's not a lot of, of a sense of one character speaking one way or the other, with a few exceptions. The Ikuhara slash Ano figure does have this very specific way of speaking, and I should point out, like, there are two Zeta Gundam references within the first hundred pages. Like, that's how deep it goes. There's one for Castle in the Sky, and it's just a line of dialogue that a character quotes. You know, there's no, you know, Castle in the Sky was an anime film by, no, if you don't recognize that line, you miss it. And that is very much the intention, that these are things that this person is just throwing out there. So, these are very much, um, this is very much a novel with very unusual characters in the sense that you have this hardcore otaku working as a director, and so the way he speaks is very different. Uh, also, the way the animator speaks is rather different just because of her personality. Otherwise, in general, again, not a huge variety in voice, if you will. One thing that folks uh, often complain about with anime and manga, and uh, in general a lot of, of Japanese stories, is that there are often weird, weird uh, coincidences in the storyline. Just strange things that just happen to, to, to come together. Fortunately, the plot in this does not hinge on any crazy coincidences. There are a couple of odd coincidences later in the novel, but they're, they're minor. They don't, you know, really change the, the plot remarkably. Um, otherwise, it feels almost painfully realistic as all these characters juggle these crazy hours and their demanding schedules and just trying to keep their health up. You know, trying to find enough hours in the day to get all this stuff done. It, it does feel like, again, real people in a real environment. Uh, finally, I do want to talk about the translation in general. And this is one of the hard things. It, it's hard to tell what is awkward translation and what was awkward in the original that is being swept along in the translation. Uh, a lot of that factual material early on does feel jarring, jumping back and forth between info dump and conversation. Uh, fortunately, nothing goes on for too long. You know, you will have maybe a paragraph's worth of explanation of here's the job of the animation director, and then you go back into the story. Um, it does look like there is a little bit of that explanatory text added by the translator. I noticed a few things where I don't think they would have needed to explain that to the average person in Japan, especially when it's a, a cultural reference. You know, something about a singer or things along those lines or how pop idol works. Idols work. So that is certainly a, um, um, uh, a thing that I cannot judge very accurately, but there are certainly some, th some things there, which I appreciated. Pretty much everything in there that they explained was helpful to me reading it. And you know, again, you, you've got to make those, those translations. You've got, to, you've got to explain those things that the average person in America would not understand. Um, and do it in a way that, that, that works within the story as like a quick aside. So I think they did a, a good job there, no, no complaints. Um, but there is, again, there's a lot of this, this material that I think just doesn't... Um, that can feel jarring. It needs to be there, but it's just the nature of this beast. Overall, I read this book in one day. I just devoured this novel. Again, it's 400 pages. I found it very engaging. I really enjoyed the characters. Um, not just enjoyed the characters. I found the characters distinctive and engaging in the sense that I understood where they were coming from. I understood their problems. And I empathized with them. The novelist does a very um, impressive job of 
creating identifiable characters, even when they're in this industry that you know, you're just definitely not a part of. So good job there. Um, I think this is really, you know, this works as a novel, but also more importantly, there is all sorts of information here about how the anime industry actually works. Facts and figures and information. And you can tell that there's a lot of research. In fact, in the back of the novel, there's, I think, two pages worth of um, acknowledgments, a page and a half of acknowledgments of different people in the anime industry that helped this author write this book. So it's definitely realistic. And so if you want to know more about how the anime industry actually works, this is a great resource for you. Hope you found that useful and entertaining. And until next time, I hope that you will be able to dig deeper into the things that you love.